updates and be part of our conversation squad. It's not true at all, as you will realize when I set out what he did while he was in South Africa. I know it's a long story. Much of what I have to tell you is picked up from writings on Gandhi as a lawyer. And one of the books I'll be drawing heavily upon is Charles de Salvo's work, The Man Before the Mahatma. So lawyers in the audience and others who probably haven't read this book should uh, do that if we want to really know more about Gandhiji as a lawyer. We begin in 1888. Gandhiji is 19 years old. On the advice of a family friend, he has traveled to England. He joins the inner temple. Even while he makes this journey to England, which is crossing the seas, his community, the Katyavadi Banias, have a serious objection to Gandhi leaving the shores. The early streaks of Mahatma Gandhi as a rebel emerged when he defied them and said he would nevertheless undertake this journey and uh, join the inner temple. He quickly realized that he has to upgrade his knowledge in a wide range of uh, topics. He takes the matriculation examination in uh, University of London and uh, he actually prepares for exams in Roman law and uh, he also takes special courses in Latin and teaches himself, and this is very important, teaches himself elocution. He goes for private classes for elocution and uh, also supports vegetarianism. He form, he's part of a vegetarian society. He writes on vegetarianism. So this is, we're talking of 1891, when the man is uh, not even 21 years, 22 years old. He's already writing what he has read, what he has ingested. So one of the first things, and I keep saying this to other lawyers too, I have tried to follow this to the best uh, uh, way possible. You read intensely, you make your notes, you write what you read, and that helps you speak with clarity. So for most lawyers, that has to be the root, reading, writing, and then speaking. And uh, if you do not follow that, you will not speak with any conviction, you will not speak with clarity, the two essential tools for being a good lawyer. Gandhiji's call to the bar on 11th June 1891, just 21 years, eight months old, immediately sets sail for Bombay. He is missing home, and uh, he doesn't have a good time joining the bar in Bombay. He struggles like any other young lawyer would. He doesn't have the courage to speak in court. He falters. He's supposed to cross-examine a witness. He's unable to do that. He sits down, but he returns the fee that he took for the case. Another indication of what the man was going to be later on, this, uh, uh, you know, taking stock of one's own strengths and weaknesses, admitting to one's weaknesses, facing it with courage, facing one's own weaknesses with courage, is a strong streak of uh, Mahatma Gandhi's life, and which you see throughout till his last days. When he failed in Bombay, he came to Rajkot, and there, with the help of his uh, brother, did a few cases, but these were not going well. They were in need of money, and uh, as a manna from heaven, the offer came for Gandhi to help in an ongoing litigation between two Indian merchants in Durban. And the case was, of course, in Pretoria. The merchants were in Durban, and they were uh, uh, having a commercial dispute between themselves. A suit had been filed in the High Court, which then went on as an arbitration between the two. There were books of accounts to be read, understood, the senior counsel engaged there needed assistance. That's when Gandhiji was asked whether he could assist. So his journey to South Africa was to assist in this one particular case. The terms were not too bad. And as I said, Gandhiji was in need of money. The family had to be supported. So he lands in Durban. One of the first encounters he has is when his client, Dada Abdullah, takes him to the local magistrate's court in Durban. 
Gandhiji is wearing a turban and the magistrate notices that and asks him to remove the turban if he wants to continue to sit in court. Again, there's a rebel in Mahatma Gandhi. He says, I refuse to remove my turban and walks out of the court. This incident is noticed in the press and written about. I must mention here that we get to know all these intricate details because the South African press more or less covered every moment of Gandhi's life in South Africa, whether in court or outside of it with his political activities. The archives of those newspapers are also available, which was what uh, De Salvo had access to, apart from, of course, the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, earlier researchers somehow, I think, except one Mr. Uppal, whose publication is not uh, well known, and uh, it was an official government publication that came out in 1995, which covers much of uh, Gandhi's work as a lawyer. We only have De Salvo's work, which has gone into the work in such depth, Gandhi's life as a lawyer. So to come back to Dada Abdullah's case, initially, Gandhiji is simply tailing the uh, senior counsel but then becomes more useful in understanding the accounts. His help is so useful and indispensable. Finally, Dada Abdullah wins the arbitration. There's an award in his favor. But Gandhiji has already understood the opponent, who is also an Indian merchant. So Gandhiji strives his best to still bring about a rapprochement between the two merchants. And he succeeds in that. And this was one of his first major successes as a lawyer, and this is what he has to say, and this is oft quoted, but I wish to quote it again. At last, Tayyab Seth agreed, an arbitrator was appointed, the case was argued before him, and Dada Abdullah won. And I'm quoting from the book Law and Lawyers. But that did not satisfy me. If my client were to seek immediate execution of the award, it would be impossible for Tayyab Seth to meet the whole of the awarded amount. And there was an unwritten law among the poor Bandar Memons living in South Africa that death should be preferred to bankruptcy. It was impossible for Tayyab Seth to pay down the whole sum of 37,000 pounds in costs. He meant to pay not a pile less than the amount and he did not want to be declared bankrupt. There was only one way Dada Abdullah sh allow, should allow him to pay in moderate installments. He was equal to the occasion and granted Tayyab Seth installments spread over a very long period. It was more difficult for me to secure this concession of payment by installments than to get the parties to agree to arbitration. But both were happy over the result and both rose in public estimation. My joy was boundless. I had learned the true practice of law. I had learned to find the better side of human nature and enter men's hearts. I realized that the true function of a lawyer was to unite parties riven asunder. The lesson was so indelibly burnt into me that a large part of my time during the 20 years of my practice as a lawyer was occupied in bringing about private compromises of hundreds of cases. I lost nothing thereby, not even money, certainly not my soul. Soon the harsh realities, re realities of an Indian living in South Africa presented itself to Mahatma Gandhi. There was a law that disenfranchised Indians, depriving them of the right to vote. So this was one of the major causes where Gandhi was roped in, again with the help of Dada Abdullah, who insisted that Gandhi should help the Indian community in drafting petitions to, uh, uh, to oppose this piece of legislation. It's a long story, but Gandhi studies the law very carefully, draws the petitions, writes in the press, and draws up different kinds of memorials with great details, explaining why the law was discriminatory. We should remember that this was a place which did not have any written constitution, which did not have courts which had the power to review legislation. The only appeal was to the legislature itself, whether it was a local legislature in South Africa or the uh, one in England, the House of Commons. The space available was only to write petitions to oppose legislation, and Gandhi made full use of it. Uh, he wrote very detailed petitions. Of course, it's another matter that they were not acted upon, and uh, they went ahead and passed the law, but it told him how useful it was to study the law very carefully. In fact, throughout his law, uh, career as a lawyer, 
you will find him studying contracts, studying provisions very carefully, interpreting them, making copious notes on them, and preparing hard for every little appearance that he made in court. One of the early cases, in fact, one of the, uh, the first three cases that Gandhi handled, and this is what Desalbo talks about, all ended not in successes in court. This is another lesson for the lawyers. You learn more from your failures than your successes. You uh, understand what the limitations of the law are, the limitation of the court is, when you uh, encounter failures, and particularly failures early on in life. While certainly the bar is a wonderful place for learning, and there are some very kind-hearted senior lawyers who will guide their junior lawyers. In eight out of 10 cases, the junior lawyers have to do all the learning on their own, by watching, by listening, by observing. And this is what uh, also was Gandhiji's method. He learned a lot from his failures. One of his early successes, as one might call it, was in dealing with the case of an indentured labor. There were several indentured labor in uh, South Africa working on the plantations and farms, all brought from India. And this was the case of one Balasundram who came from Tamil Nadu. Balasundram happens to walk into Gandhiji's uh, office badly injured. His master, a South African, has beaten him up so badly that he's bleeding from his head. And uh, afraid to even remove the turban, it's soaked in blood. And Gandhiji sees what he can do. And uh, he goes to the local magistrate, files a complaint. The case is progressing. He manages to convince the magistrate that the owner was in error and uh, gets a, a verdict in favor of Balasundram but realizes that this will not really help Balasundram because he will be out of a job, to ask, so he asks, given the circumstances, that he be transferred to another owner, which is what happens. So Gandhiji is also looking at the limitations of the law, of execution of uh, orders. You may succeed in a case, you may get an order in your favor, but you may be unable to execute it. He takes count of the uh, social realities, he sees what is the best that can be done to make sure that Balasundram does not lose his livelihood and finds a compassionate a person in South Africa with whom he was to associate himself later in life who would take Balasundram under his wings. After the Balasundram case, and this is all written about in the press, that Gandhiji takes up cases of not just merchants but also of other classes of Indians became known and it introduced him to another whole community there in South Africa. At the end of uh, this experience, there is a visit that he makes to India, where again he finds that uh, it's not easy to uh, just merge into the Indian crowd here. He falters, there is a memorial written by him, it's called a green pamphlet about the problems of South Africans, of Indians in South Africa, which receives wide publicity here but which angers the Europeans back in South Africa. So when the ship returns, and this time he returns with uh, Kasturba and the two children, the ship is stopped, not allowed to dock on the ground of quarantine because the epidemic of plague has broken out and very reminiscent of what happened during the COVID times, the ship is not allowed to dock and passengers are not allowed to alight. Uh, Gandhiji braves all this. There is a time when that quarantine period is over, and against advice of his friends, he disembarks. He's roughed up, beaten up, but there's a kindly lady, uh, Mrs. Alexander, who saves him and nurses him, and uh, it's providential that he escaped uh, with uh, those severe injuries, managed to survive, but it also showed tenacity, it showed courage, it showed a willingness to face adversity and not run away when uh, you, know, you have to take responsibility for actions. He realized that he had raised the political pitch there in South Africa and he needed to take responsibility for his actions. Uh, I will skip now to the period up to 1899 when his uh, uh, practice in South Africa, in Durban particularly, has picked up rather well. He's filing petitions with the government against laws, discriminatory laws. There's a Dealers Licensing Act, which ends up in actually discriminating against Indian hawkers. 
and Indian merchants. He petitions against it. He's unsuccessful in the Natal Supreme Court, but that does not deter him. The major shift that happens is in 1901, when he makes the second visit to India. He thinks he's wound up his place in South Africa as a lawyer. He comes to India. This time, he does not have such a bad experience in the high court in Bombay and in the, uh, back in the courts in Gujarat. But there is a calling that comes from South Africa saying that uh, there's going to be a visit of a Lord Hardinge, from, uh, who is a secretary of the colonies at that stage, to South Africa. And the Indian community chooses him to represent its cause before him. And therefore comes the second sojourn that Gandhiji has in South Africa. This time he decides to shift his practice to Transvaal. Natal is Durban, Transvaal is Johannesburg, Pretoria and Johannesburg. And uh, he decides to shift to Transvaal. There's resistance to admitting Gandhiji as a lawyer in Transvaal. He decides to forego his practice as an advocate, as a barrister who can appear in the high courts and argue cases, to being a solicitor in Transvaal. It's a major sacrifice that one has to make. But he, he sees that the issues in Transvaal require a person like him to uh, you know, be there for the Indian community, for the Indian merchants, and for the Indian laborers in Transvaal. There are three statutes that clearly discriminate against the Indians. One is the Immigration Restriction Act. That is, if you've not been registered under the Asiatic Law Amendment Act, which requires you to give your fingerprints and to register, then you can be deported under the Immigrant Restriction Act. Some exception was made for educated Indians to enter, and there was a controversy about what amounts to education. Then the third was the Priest Preservation Ordinance. The triumvirate of these laws made sure that Indians who refused to register, who refused to give their fingerprints, would not only be you know, uh, punished uh, because it was a criminal offense, but also face the risk of deportation. So Gandhiji sets up office in uh, Johannesburg. And uh, one of the early cases that uh, he takes up is in 1906 in the form of test litigation. In 1906, electric trams were introduced in Johannesburg. There was a law which stated that uh, there would be tram cars only for Europeans and not for Asians or the coloreds. Gandhiji wanted to test this law, test the fairness of this law. So we're talking at a time when there's no option of filing like we have now in India, filing a writ petition in a high court challenging the constitutionality of a statute. No such option exists. This is 1906, and the, uh, uh, the genius of the man is so evident when he decides to test the law to show its irrationality, to show its uh, illegality. So he requests a wealthy Indian merchant to board one of the Europeans only tram car accompanied by a white person who happened to be working in Gandhiji's office. The law then permitted the reverse. A European could board with an Indian servant and not the other way around. They board in the tram car. For some reason, they are not stopped. The second day, Gandhiji again requests the same thing to be done. This time, they are stopped. The conductor says, I will not allow you. He says, as long as the other person is not your servant, you cannot... Uh, uh, the, that is, the uh, Indian has to be the servant of the European, not the other way around. He stops him. A case is filed by Gandhiji against the conductor for refusing entry to the Indian merchant because there is another law which enjoins conductors of tramways to compulsorily admit all passengers. So there's a conflict in two laws. He gets a conviction of the conductor for violating that law which mandates that the conductor should allow passengers, and then demonstrates how this law, which prohibits coloreds and Indians from boarding European-only tram cars, is unlawful. There's a second case brought up within a week. Here again, Gandhiji succeeds, because when the local municipal council says, we've issued a license to the uh, 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 tram company to uh, you know, uh, have European-only tram cars, 
he's able to show that that license was issued after the incident took place and not before. So man is clear about the procedure, about the technicalities, and this receives wide publicity. Using the court space as a democratic space to uh, you know, play out your politics, using the court space, uh, space to show the unjustness of the law were early things that he learned in his life as a lawyer. He knew he was in a very unfair system. He knew that he was facing courts which were prejudiced, which were biased. In fact, there were cases which he argued in Durban where the judges would be hostile to him. There was one particular case of a claim by a captain of a ship against the ship owner. And uh, when Gandhiji is in the midstream of his arguments, the judge asks him, have you read the admiralty law? And Gandhiji is forced to admit that he hasn't read the admiralty law because he didn't see it being immediately relevant, but realized that he had not prepared well enough. But doesn't take that as a setback. Prepares harder, calls for evidence, examines witnesses, puts forth his arguments in the best possible way. So what you find, and this is observed by the press too in Johannesburg and earlier in Durban, that the man brought a quiet dignity to the court, never lost his temper in court, uh, was able to be forceful and firm when he presented cases, was very clear in what he was speaking, would admit when he did not know the law, would admit if he had made an error on facts, there was one case where he was uh, a lawyer for one of the uh, merchants who had succeeded and an award was being challenged in the court. He told his clients that there is a mistake in the accountancy and we should fairly admit it to the court. The senior lawyer deferred. He said, after all, we are defending an award. Why should we tell the court that there is a mistake in the award? After all, it's for the other side to point it out. Gandhi said, no, I think it's important to tell the court, even as a strategy, that we are being fair and objective. We are pointing out to the court that there is one, only one error in the award. And that strategy worked. Ultimately, the award was modified only correcting the error. But if they had proceeded to hide this from the court, the court may have been persuaded to set aside the entire award. So this fairness in court was much appreciated by the judges and by the bar. A lawyer who's fair in court earns the respect of the bar. It's not so much about winning or losing cases, it's earning the trust of the court. When I speak to lawyers, even as a judge of 17 years, I keep telling them, once you come before the court and you make your first two statements, the judge hearing you knows several things about you. One is, are you prepared in the case? Do you know your facts? Do you know the law? And a, a, a discerning judge will also be able to make out whether he, the lawyer speaking can be trusted. There is some silent communication that passes between the bar and the bench. And this is what I think uh, made Gandhiji rise in the esteem of his fellow men. Uh, I can quite imagine Gandhi standing erect, as we've seen in many pictures of his and his uh, posture, facing the court, seeing eye to eye, and calmly stating what he knew. And uh, this earned him a lot of respect, even in his political life, where he was very active in Johannesburg. You just give me a small break. Just to complete the tram car cases, soon, of course, the law itself was changed. They removed that part of the law which mandated that conductors should admit all passengers. And so the discrimination remained. One could see this as a failure in using the court for you know, uh, uh, pointing out the unjustness of the laws. But in terms of a long-term strategy, one can't see it as a failure. One can see it as use of the public space of the court for political purposes. He was definitely a performative lawyer. Every time a case came up in the court and he had to defend the uh, uh, person who is invariably the Indian or the colored. He knew that he was on a weak wicket as far as the law is concerned, but made his best in terms of uh, his skills at cross-examination to bring out the weaknesses in the state's case. Invariably, it was the deep bias of the judge hearing the case that resulted in the so-called dismissal or failure of the case from Gandhiji's point of view. But what it did to the collective public opinion was something different. The more these cases were written about, the more they quoted Gandhiji's 
speeches in different cases in the court, it became clear to the public that the law was working adverse to the Indians, it was deliberately shaped to deprive them of their basic rights. And in that, he succeeded. The second thing, he earned quite a lot as a lawyer. He didn't do only these kind of test cases or cases defending uh, Indians who violated these three laws that I talked about. He did hardcore cases, uh, 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 civil cases, cases of contracts, and a wide uh, variety of other cases. I just want to read out one passage from DeSalvo where he tells us what Gandhiji was up to. His practice was demanding. Much of his time was consumed, as he described it later, with office work, conveyancing, and arbitration. The importance of this work in Gandhi's mind might be reflected as having spent practically no effort in his memoirs to describe it. A letter book mentioned by the compilers of the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi and containing some thousand exemplars of Gandhi client correspondence would likely have given us a detailed understanding of Gandhi's office work. That evidence, however, appears to no longer exist. What evidence does remain appears to indicate that Gandhi did, in fact, spend a good portion of his time in chambers doing the sort of ordinary work one might expect of a lawyer with a busy civil practice. The record as we have it gives us some hints as to what this work was. Some work involved negotiating the rental purchase and sale of property and attending to routine legal work that surrounded such transactions. Gandhi was also frequently occupied in obtaining opinions from other practitioners in the areas of their expertise on the rights of his Indian clients. And he seems to have spent a fair amount of time engaged in correspondence in which we dealt with financial aspects of its practice, sometimes quarreling with others about what he or his clients owed them. He always felt guilty of the kind of money he was making. He had a fairly large office. He mentored juniors. One of them was Mr. Polak. He poured all that money into running the Indian Opinion, the newspaper that he brought out, in which he wrote extensively and voiced all his opinions. So, and it was about giving back to society. So you've heard of the uh, uh, Phoenix Farm in uh, Durban and the Tolstoy Farm in Johannesburg, where he decided, inspired by the writings of uh, Raskin and Thoreau, that work was very important. Physical labor was important to be performed uh, for cleansing the soul and for giving back to society. I'll uh, now come back to the, uh, another central part of his uh, practice which is civil disobedience. The law was definitely against the Indians. He knew it. Every time an Indian had to cross from Natal to Transvaal, he needed to show that he was registered under the uh, Asiatic Law Amendment Act, and uh, if he did not face the risk of deportation. So there were occasions when, as a test case, people would cross back to Natal and try and re-enter Transvaal and were promptly arrested, faced trial. Gandhiji himself, at one point, crossed back from Natal into Transvaal, refused to register, refused to give his fingerprints, and faced arrest and trial. So there were four or five strategies that Gandhiji adopted to counter this unfair law, because attempts at getting the law repealed through England proved futile. I'm crossing over the stage when he worked for the British in the Boer War, expecting that once Transvaal fell into the hands of, the Brit of uh, uh, England, the law would change, that did not happen. They continued these unjust laws, and he was very disappointed. So in the first phase of agitation, he gives a stirring speech on 11 September 2006 about the strategy they should adopt in refusing to obey the law. And uh, that speech, I'll just uh, quote from it because uh, this is, again, something that's been quoted quite often. Uh, I know full well that it is open to the government of the colony to give a repeal to this, of this legislation today, to throw dust into our eyes and then embark upon another legislation for Asha far more humiliating, but the lesson that I wanted to learn myself, the lesson I would have my countrymen learn from the struggle is this, that unenfranchised though we are, 
unrepresented though we are in Transvaal, it is open to us to clothe ourselves with an undying franchise, and this consists in recognizing our humanity, in recognizing that we are part and parcel of the great universal whole, that there is the maker of us ruling over all destinies of mankind, and that our trust should be in him rather than in earthly kings. And if my countrymen recognize that position, I say that no matter what legislation is passed over our heads, if that legislation is in conflict with our ideas of right and wrong, if it is in conflict with our conscience, if it is in conflict with our religion, then we can say we shall not submit to that legislation. So this was the basic uh, uh, thrust at civil disobedience. After this stirring speech in Empire Theatre on uh, 11 September two, uh, 1906, uh, they decide, after having failed to get General Smuts to uh, arrive at a settlement, in fact, Gandhiji goes in for a settlement and finds that Smuts has betrayed him and goes back on all the promises that he makes. Four strategies are adopted using the courts. One is, of course, this uh, incarceration and incineration. So what they decide is that they will burn the registration certificates. This happens because the attempt at going to the Supreme Court in Pretoria and getting the court to permit them to withdraw the registrations that they had made voluntarily in view of the settlement with Sputs, that failed. The court said, we cannot allow you to withdraw your applications, your registrations. So Gandhiji then decides the next course of action is to burn the registration certificates. So on 17th August of uh, 1908, there's a huge, uh, uh, in, in a mosque, they gather and burn as many as 1,500 registration certificates and 500 traders licenses, face prosecution for that, face imprisonment. The second strategy is about hawkers' licenses. Gandhiji says we will uh, apply for licenses, we'll refuse to give fingerprints. If they deny us licenses, we'll still go ahead and hawk on the streets. Gandhiji's son, Harilal, is one of them who violates the law this way, is arrested. He offers no defense. In fact, whenever it was either Harilal or Gandhiji who faced trial for violating the law, they would just stand silently, not offer any defense, and face the punishment. This suffering, the self-suffering, was with a view to pointing out to the harshness of the law, to making the oppressor realize that he does not have the cooperation of the oppressed. So this was another strategy that Gandhiji adopted, using the court space. But when it came to other defendants in court, fellow uh, Indians, Gandhiji would put up a stout defense. He would pick up the technicalities in the law. He would pick up the procedural errors of the law that he learned from his senior, Mr. Lafton, in Durban, and try and advance the case. Of course, he did not succeed in many of the cases. In some cases, like in Shapurji, Sorabji's case, he won the first round in showing the technical limitations of the law and the failures of procedure. And Shapurji had to be released from imprisonment. But the South African government of the day, knowing what it was doing, re-arrested him to make over the uh, procedural lapses. But this did not deter either, the, either Gandhiji or the fellow Indians from going back to the court facing repeated arrests, facing repeated imprisonment as part of the civil disobedience movement where they silently suffered, hoping for a change to be brought. One was to draw attention of the people in England, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, cabinet in England, to take note of the unjustness of the laws in South Africa. The other was to uh, raise the pitch of the political debate so that that could ultimately be political change. It's another matter that these strategies may not have worked during Gandhiji's time, but they left lasting lessons for future generations. Nelson Mandela was one who was very inspired by Gandhiji's life and work in South Africa. He writes about it extensively, about how it helped him to shape the strategies of the uh, African National Congress in fighting apartheid. Martin Luther King, the, uh, uh, who spearheaded the civil rights movement in the United States, says how this Gandhi's uh, life and work inspired him, particularly uh, civil disobedience. We are now reaching the uh, beginning of uh, two th uh, 1910, when uh, uh, two or three cases breaks Gandhiji's faith in the courts in South Africa. Uh, in one case, three Indian merchants are tried for failing to produce registration certificates 
uh, they have the registration certificate, but they're conscientious objectors, and uh, they're facing deportation. They say that they've committed no harm. Gandhiji's defense fails, and they are sentenced. There's another case of an Indian merchant having a son aged below the age of 16 added on to his immigration certificate. But when the son crosses the age of 16, the government steps in to say he does not have a valid registration certificate. In this particular case, they go up to the Supreme Court of the new Republic of South Africa that was formed in 1910, and they succeed before that Supreme Court. Uh, but this experience leaves Gandhiji bitter about the limitations of using the court space. Then last of the cases was one of Ramabai Soda, whose husband was imprisoned, and uh, she had to, and he died. She did not have a registration paper. Gandhiji's attempt at showing that the husband was fully qualified to re-enter Transvaal because he was an educated Indian, and therefore his wife automatically had the same right. That failed but he's able to extract a concession from Smuts that she will not be imprisoned. But though both these cases leave him quite embittered, and he decides to quit practice and go entirely into civil disobedience and uh, politics. And uh, we all know how he led the agitationists to strike down the three pound tax law. And uh, in 1914, finally, in 1911, he quits practice. In 1914, he comes back to India. Coming to India, again, tells us about uh, 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 what he attempted to do in challenging unjust laws, whether it was the Champaran agitation, where, by the way, he roped in lawyers from Patna. One of the young lawyers whom he roped in was uh, Babu Rajendra Prasad. That's also been written about. Gandhiji himself wrote extensively while he was in India, traveled extensively, mingled with people, understood people's problems. Uh, I will refer to only two cases that he faced. Uh, he, went, he went before courts. One was in 1919, when he was arraigned for contempt of court. The, uh, uh, following the Jallianwala Bagh massacre, the bar had decided to abstain from work and said, we will not participate in courts. The district judge in Ahmedabad sought and, uh, uh, made a reference to the high court in Bombay, what he should do uh, with this kind of a bar, and was it not illegal? That was published by Gandhiji in the journal, and both Gandhiji and Mahade Desai faced proceedings for contempt of court. And uh, again, you find them uh, not uh, you know, prepared to defend themselves because they are objecting to the law itself. Uh, I'll just read one, form, one small uh, statement. Before the issue of rules, certain correspondence passed with the registrar of the Honorable Court and myself on 11 December. I addressed to the registrar a letter which sufficiently explains my conduct. I therefore attach a copy of the said letter. I regret that I have not found it possible to accept the advice given by His Lordship, the Chief Justice, about him having to apologize. Moreover, I have been unable to accept the advice because I do not consider that I have committed either a legal or a moral breach by publishing Mr. Kennedy's, the judge letter or but commenting on the contents thereof. I am sure this honorable court would not want me to tender an apology unless it be sincere and express regret for an action which I have held to be the privilege and duty of a journalist. I shall therefore cheerfully and respectfully accept the punishment that this honorable court may be pleased to impose upon me for the indication of the majesty of the law. So this strategy he always adopted to tell the court that this is an unjust law, so I will not obey it. But you, as the court, should anyway do what you're supposed to do under the law. And if you punish me under the law, I believe in the rule of law, so I'll accept the punishment. So this is a very clear strategy that gets played out in many courts in South Africa, and definitely in the courts in India. So this strategy is something that they could do nothing about, because it was all within the framework of the rule of law. And it also told others that the right to dissent is a valuable right, which you need to keep asserting every now and then. The next case, which is a much talked about case, is the 1920, 1922 trial for sedition. And uh, I would just like to read a few parts of the statement, written statement that Gandhiji makes. I'm quoting now. The law itself in this country 
has been used to serve the foreign exploiter. My unbiased examination of the Punjab martial law cases has led me to believe that at least 95% of the convictions were wholly bad. My experience of political cases in India leads me to the conclusion that in nine of 10, the condemned men were totally innocent. Their crime consisted in the love of their country. In 99 cases out of 100, justice has been denied to Indians as against Europeans in the courts in India. This is not an exaggerated picture. It is his experience of almost every Indian who has anything to do with such cases. In my opinion, the administration of the law is thus prostituted consciously or unconsciously for the benefit of the exploiter. And then he also goes on to say it. In fact, I believe that I have rendered a service to India and England by showing in non-cooperation the way out of the unnatural state in which both are living. In my humble opinion, non-cooperation with evil is as much a duty as is cooperation with good. But in the past, non-cooperation has been deliberately expressed in violence to the evildoer. I am endeavoring to show to my countrymen that violent non-cooperation only multiplies evil and that as evil can only be sustained by violence, withdrawal of support of evil requires complete abstention from violence. Non-violence implies voluntary submission to the penalty for non-cooperation with evil. I am here, therefore, to invite and submit cheerfully to the highest penalty that can be inflicted upon me for what in law is a deliberate crime and what appears to me to be the highest duty of a citizen. The only course open to you, the judge, Mr. Broomfield, is either to resign your post and thus dissociate yourself from evil if you feel that the law you are called upon to administer is an evil and that in reality I am innocent, or to inflict on me the severest penalty if you believe that the system and law you are assisting to administer are good for the people of this country and that my activity is therefore injurious to the public weal. So this uh, appealing to the goodness of a human being, appealing to the conscience of a judge, this is a mastery of uh, uh, advocacy, I would say. It's of the advocacy of the highest order. When you know everything is against you, you appeal to the conscience of the judge, and this man does this masterfully. So as Broomfield ends, he sentences him to six years of imprisonment. And I should like to say, this is what Broomfield says, I should like to say in doing so that if the course of events in India should make it possible for you, for, for the government to reduce the period and release you, no one will be better pleased than I. So he's already troubled the conscience of the judge. These questions resonate for us through history. When the Nuremberg trials took place, when the Tokyo trials took place, it was the uh, 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 victor's version of justice, not the victim's version of justice. Uh, the, uh, uh, the question that was raised by Radha Binodpal, Justice Radha Binodpal in the Tokyo trials is worth reading in this regard about what is the right thing to do. Uh, I would like to now come to the end of the lecture by drawing on what lessons we can learn from the life of uh, Mahatma Gandhi as a lawyer. Uh, one is tremendous courage, courage of conviction, courage of facing adversity at personal, great personal physical risk as well. Uh, Gandhi faced assault not only in 1897 when the ship tried to land back from India into uh, Durban, but he was even assaulted by fellow Indians when they saw him as uh, compromising too easily on the uh, Asiatic Law Amendment Act which required registration because he had entered into a settlement with smuts on voluntary registrations on the condition that the law would not be enforced against voluntary registrars. Of course, smuts went back on this assurance and Gandhi, Gandhi faced, faced the hostility of his own community. But it did not deter him because he knew he was on the side of truth and he believed that, that nonviolence was the answer. So one lesson is that you don't give up. Even when the system and law is against you and, and there's, there's no, no support, support from the bar and the people you're fighting for, one must keep working with perseverance. Uh, that requires a lot of uh, inner calm and clarity. Second, there can be no excuse for lack of professionalism. Gandhiji himself was an expert at drafting and he learned it the hard way. His advice, especially for lawyers, and judges while drafting legal documents was, was that they should not say anything more than that was necessary. Use of adjectives in legal documents never serves the cause and purpose of the document. And I just want to read one small passage for this, which uh, 
brings out. Gandhiji has fairly admitted that he learned this lesson from Gopal Krishna Gokhale and Dadabai Nauroji, who always impressed on him that if he wanted to be heard, he must be brief, he must write to the point and adhere to facts, must never travel beyond the cause and the notice, and that he should be most sparing in his adjectives. This is a, a lesson that should be learned by every lawyer. We tend sometimes to get very emotional in court. Our sentences become rhetorical and somehow alienates the person listening to our arguments and who the person who has to give the verdict. So this is something that we should bear in mind that you act professionally, keep your cool and calm, don't unnecessarily use adjectives and be as brief and precise as possible. Gandhiji also demonstrated the power of the pen and documenting. And this is something, again, as lawyers, we must realize. Because he wrote so extensively, kept diaries, kept writing the journal, we know so much about his life. He actually led an open and transparent life. It, today, we are able to criticize him for the prejudices he may have demonstrated in his early years in South Africa. For instance, he didn't want the Indians to be equated with what whom he called uh, uh, fakirs, uh, kafirs, uh, that is referring to the uh, uh, tribal population in uh, South Africa. We are able to say all that because he wrote all that in his journal. And he also reflected on his weaknesses in his writings. And uh, this documenting has now helped us construct the full picture of the man. And he will continue to be studied, I think, for several millennia hereafter. I believe that public interest litigation lawyers should take a leave from Gandhiji's uh, uh, no, career as a lawyer, uh, uh, life as a lawyer, and uh, document all that they have and put it in the public domain. Uh, I must share with you that Urusa High Court has a PIL portal where we have put on, uh, on uh, for public consumption all the orders in every PIL that is actively being considered by the Urusa High Court. And we've also put the uh, reports that are submitted in those PILs and even links to the live streamings, hearings of such PILs. So I think even as PIL lawyers, we should not privatize the information we come across. We should uh, share the document in public domain. Uh, the next lesson that we learn from his is that failed cases are more important than the cases that have been won. And uh, he used these failures to develop as a lawyer and do strength from them. He would use the court to challenge the unjust nature of the laws not only as a place for wins and losses. While making a speech in front of a judge, he not only realized when it turned political, but also knew how to leave a permanent impression on the mind of the judge. He then stuck, that another important lesson is stuck with his principles. He would not lie in court. He simply would refuse to do that. He would place facts before the court, and he would tell his client fairly what his chances were. There's a case of Pasi Rusamji, who is caught smuggling some goods into the country, and he frankly admits this to Gandhiji, and Gandhiji says, you should go and admit this to the customs officer. And this is what he does and gets away with the penalty and avoids imprisonment, and realizes the importance of sticking to truth. Gandhiji also used this test case strategy. We now talk of test cases in the 20th century and 21st century, but we are talking of uh, uh, Gandhiji doing this in 1906 in Johannesburg, this is to demonstrate the unjustness of the laws. And uh, he also showed that there is always a space in the bar for honest lawyers. He earned a tremendous reputation not only among the lawyers, among the community, but even among the judges. So when Gandhiji stood up in court in his later years as a lawyer, the court would listen with rapt attention because he commanded that kind of a respect. Uh, I would also say that this appealing to the goodness in human beings that stayed with him throughout in life uh, many of these strategies have sought to be replicated by many others. I mean, we can think of, of course, King, uh, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Aung San Suu Kyi, many others who've used this uh, technique of uh, civil disobedience, of silent suffering. Not all have su su succeeded. There have been failures too. I can think of Irom Sharbila, who fasted for God knows for more than a decade. And, uh, 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 we can think of successes when we think of the farmer's agitation. Again, a silent protest of uh, defenseless people, but sending out a very clear message. We can think of the protests at Shaheen Bagh, 
we can think of uh, Stan Swami, Father Stan Swami, who suffered silently, but you know, with very poignant results. And uh, this experimenting with civil disobedience, silent suffering, I think has its own space in political discourses. I think Gandhi tells us it will continue to be relevant. It may not always succeed. A Tiananmen Square did not succeed. A Tahrir Square did not succeed. Many of the pink, orange revolutions in Eastern Europe maybe did not succeed. Maybe it helped overthrow a government which was oppressive, but brought in its place a government which was more oppressive. But this is evolution of democracy, evolution of principles which we learn to live by, but tells us that we must voice our protests at the risk of personal safety, at the risk of uh, you know, great harm to oneself and to one's family. Gandhiji's fa family suffered a lot with all his political activity. His son suffered a lot. Kasturba suffered a lot. But that was the price that they were prepared to pay for the betterment of humankind. This appealing to the conscience of people, appealing to the conscience of judges, appealing to the conscience of law enforcers, this has to be a constant endeavor. Particularly in times like this, when they're afraid to speak, when they're afraid of the consequences of speech, we should learn a lot from the life of Mahatma Gandhi. I would just end with uh, one quote, which is what Sarojini Naidu says about what happened in the sedition trial which he had attended. This is what she wrote. A convict and a criminal in the eye of law, that's Mahatma Gandhi, nevertheless the entire court rose. Nevertheless the entire court rose in an act of spontaneous homage when Mahatma Gandhi entered. A frail, serene, indomitable figure in a coarse and scanty loincloth accompanied by his devoted disciple, fellow prisoner, Shankarlal Banker. This is what Gandhiji playfully tells Sarojini Naidu. So you're seated near me to give you your support in case I break down, he jested, with that happy laugh of his, which seems to hold all the undimmed radiance of the world's childhood in its depths. And looking around at the hosts of family faces of men and women who had traveled far to offer him a token of their love, he added, this is like a family gathering and not a law court. A thrill of mingled fear, pride, hope, and anguish ran through the crowded hall when the judge took his seat. An admirable judge, deserving of a praise alike for his brave and resolute sense of duty, his flawless courtesy, his just perception of a unique occasion, and his fine tribute to a unique personality. Then she goes on. I realized anew that the lowly Jesus of Nazareth cradled in a manger furnished the only true parallel in history to the sweet, invincible apostle of Indian liberty, who has loved humanity with surpassing compassion, and to use his own beautiful phrase, approached the poor with the mind of the poor. The pent-up emotion of the people burst in a storm of sorrow as a long, slow procession moved towards him in a mournful pilgrimage of farewell, clinging to the hands that had toiled so incessantly, bowing over the feet that had overruled so continuously in the service of his country. In the midst of this poignant scene of many-voiced and myriad-hearted grief, he stood untroubled in all his transcendent simplicity, the embodied soul of the Indian nation, its living sacrifice and a sacrament in one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Justice Murlidhar. We now open this uh, session for Q&A. Um, I would suggest you raise your hands and the, our volunteers with mics will come to you. Uh, please keep your questions short and direct. Do I see any hands go up? There's one hand up here. Uh, Sunita Reddy. Can we have the mic here in the front row? Here, front row. Excuse me. Yes, front row here. Hello. 
can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you, sir, for sharing all these wonderful snippets of Gandhiji as a lawyer. Most of us know a little him loudly. Mostly, most of us know him uh, mostly as a freedom fighter. I wonder what Gandhiji would say if he were um, alive today about the judiciary. Um, see, we feel very free to call out corruption among politicians, and rightly so. I mean, universally, we think that all politicians are corrupt. We call out corruption among, to some extent, among bureaucrats, among professionals in different fields. But there is a kind of gag order about talking anything to do with the judiciary, when in fact, they are the ones who can, I mean, root out corruption entirely if they are correct. So what would Gandhiji have done if he were alive today? And especially, you know, I say this because politicians, however corrupt they are, they have to go back every five years and answer their constituents. But you are a judge, you become a judge for life. So I what think, would Sunita, we've got it. Yes. Yeah, take the question or do you take all the questions? Okay. You take all the questions together? I think that would be better. No? Okay. Uh, we have, yes, we'll come to you later, uh, Sahim, and then... Yeah, I've got two questions and how much of current uh, jurispr jurisprudence positively responds to appeals to their conscience as compared to Gandhi's time during his early practice? Has it improved or deteriorated? Second question is, do you think that democratic institutions in India have deteriorated across the last few decades? And if so, can Gandhi's prescriptions still apply to resurrect them or is the damage in some cases irreversible? Uh, we have a third question from there. Yes. Uh, good morning, sir. So, yeah. are there any specific instances or uh, life experiences with Gandhiji faced due to which he has uh, turned from a lawyer to a politician or a nationalist he currently is known for? Sorry, can you just repeat that? So, are there any uh, specific instances or life experiences which made Gandhiji turn from a lawyer into a social figure? There's one more hand in the same row. Yes. Any. Sir, out of curiosity, I am asking one question, sir. Were there any criminal cases handled by Mahatma Gandhi either in South Africa or in India? Yeah. Uh, shall we take just one more question and you can answer? Yes. Yes, Thank there. Yeah. Oh, one second. Thank you very much for a very articulate presentation, sir. Uh, I was jotting down notes uh, while you were making a masterful presentation. Uh, I teach communication and I talk about the importance of logos, ethos and pathos while making your arguments. Mahatma Gandhi's uh, uh, career as a lawyer spoke about the attention to detail, building a logical narrative, rigorous study and uh, an adherence to truth. Do you see some of these, some of these attributes slacking down uh, among, the new, among the new crop of lawyers, especially I've seen this in my own uh, role as a teacher, I've seen the art of argumentation going down, uh, especially in the post-COVID era. You see some of these uh, qualities slacking among the young generation of lawyers. Right. One final question, uh, this uh, here, lady from here. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chandra ma'am. I'm Madhavi. And uh, sir, my question is this, was there uh, a judge recusing himself uh, that functionality uh, available during Gandhiji's time? And is it something that uh, uh, came up recently? Because it's interesting and I'm, I'm non-judiciary person, I'm a management person. So uh, that there is still no uniform code uh, regarding recusing in the law and in our constitution. So anything that you could throw light on, yeah, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. We've already had too many questions. Who's? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, with all due respects to the positive side of Mahatma Gandhi, what is this? Have you, have you read something about Mahatma Gandhi to be the agent of the British. Have you read something about it and can you share? Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> so uh, I'll take the first question about today's judiciary. Uh, we are a product of the society we are in. Judges are also human beings. Judges come from this uh, uh, larger heredity of lawyers. Whether you find judges appointed to the magistrate's court or the district courts or the high court, even to the Supreme Court, some directly from the bar. The bar is the basic nursery from where all judges come. So very often when we talk about judges, we ignore or we avoid talking about the bar. And uh, this, after 17 years as a judge, I realized that most of our debate is focused sharply on judges and very little on lawyers. If you understand the process, and this is what Gandhi's life also tells us, uh, Gandhi's life as a lawyer tells us, lawyers have a major role in shaping the verdicts in courts. How much lawyers cooperate in getting a case through, how good is your investigation, how sound is your charge sheet, how good is the evidence presented, and uh, what verdict you expect from the court. What are the adjournments sought? Who are the ones seeking the adjournment? In criminal cases, the judge cannot travel on his own without the cooperation of lawyers. So we need to see it in a holistic perspective. But what I need to tell you is this. Not much has changed from the judiciary of those times to the judiciary now. Not much has changed from the bar of those times to the bar of these times. During Gandhi's time also, you had conscientious lawyers. In fact, Shapurji, uh, Sorabji, Gandhi encouraged him to go to the bar. And he came back to South Africa and uh, uh, did cases the way uh, Gandhiji did. In India, too, we've had several such lawyers. We can count them in their fingers, but they do exist. In every bar, there's a lawyer who will stand up for causes, who will take a lot of flack. He'll take a flack from the court, from other lawyers, but he'll stand his ground. This city should be proud to have KG Kanabiran as a senior lawyer who stood for all these difficult cases, all these difficult uh, moments in court where he was constantly bombarded with hostility, but faced up to it. So in various moments, we've had lawyers who've taken on the tough causes. We've had judges who've had a conscience. But just to answer your question, I think he would have wanted a complete overall of the system. He would have had it, he wanted us to rethink how we order the bar. He would want lawyers to answer the conscience. In fact, I didn't read out all those passages about what he has to say about lawyers, about their charging exorbitant fees about not standing up for the poor, about using the profession to you know, uh, make lives miserable rather than uh, you know, solve problems. It's all there in law and lawyers. Not much has changed from those days and today. The debate happened then. The debate will continue to happen now. I think we still need that change that we're seeking. And Gandhi would definitely be part of the persons who advocate for that change. Again, we have to appeal to the collective conscience. We can't talk only of judges and not talk of lawyers. We can't talk only of them and not the executive, of the police, of a larger ecosystem, which is all you know, in a broken down uh, uh, manner functioning because it's all strained beyond its resources. It's a debate for a mu much wider debate. I just don't want us to reduce it to the role of judges alone in this uh, debate. The next is uh, appealing to the conscience. It does happen. There is occasionally a good order that comes from the court where you know it, whatever the facts are, have appealed to the court's conscience. That it does not happen as frequently as, as we would like it to happen is a reflection of our times. I would still be a positive, uh, I mean, optimist, and uh, expect that we would have more people to, whom, who, to whose conscience we can appeal to rather than less. I think we have to produce from amongst ourselves more people who would uh, uh, listen to their conscience and do what is right, stand by the side of truth, these people have always been in a minority throughout world history. You can count on your fingers Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Aung San Suu Kyi. The, the list is, uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, you can have a short list of such people. That's the uh, history of mankind. But you don't stop trying, you don't stop fighting, you don't stop voicing your concern. So that has to be a work in progress, and we can only hope that we have a better society in the years to come. Uh, there was a, uh, 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 the experience that turned Gandhi from a lawyer to a political figure. I would not pose the question like that. He was always a political figure. If you read the man before the Mahatma, from the days of his being in England, he was a political figure. 
He took definite stances. He was not afraid of taking positions. He was always on the side of truth. And uh, when you act in court for causes, you're also acting politically. You can't really you know, divorce these two things completely. You're opposing some politics, you're advocating some politics. So it, at, at one point, he ceases to be a lawyer and becomes a full-time political activist. That is the time of 1910 when I told you that he was tired of going back to court again and again and losing cases, finding that he's not making headway in making the government listen, making them change the law, and that's where he decides that he'll hand over his practice to his associates and move to a full-time political activist. But it was not that he was doing only lawyering and then abandoned that to become a political activist. Uh, criminal cases, Balasundram's case was a criminal case. And he did other criminal cases of endangered labor in South Africa. These are all written up in uh, this book by uh, uh, DeSalvo. When he came to India, he did not practice. That is, when he came in 1914, after that he did not take up law practice. He was only into politics full time. So he did do criminal cases while he was in South Africa. Uh, today's lawyers have a lot to learn from the life of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. I've listed out some of those things which I spoke to you about. This tenacity, this unwillingness to give up, uh, to use the court as a political space, but not just for rhetoric. I think if you work hard enough on a case and present it in a neat, professional manner, you will get an audience in court. The judges may or may not agree with you, but you would have made your point, it would be written about, and others will learn from what you did in court. And that's very important. It forms a precedent. They will learn what to do and what not to do from your failure or success in court. I don't know if I've answered your question that uh, Gandhi will always be a, a, a torchbearer uh, in this uh, regard. There are no written rules, I would agree with you, on recusal, but I would urge you to see the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996, since you are from the corporate side. It has schedules to the Act, which says what could amount to conflict of interests. So the nice thing in arbitration is the judge is supposed to disclose the interest right at the outset, tell the parties that this is the interest I have, and do you still agree to my hearing the case or not agree uh, uh, to hear the case? So, and there are some uh, 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 events which are spelt out in the schedule, which completely, you know, it's a close relative whose case is before you, you cannot be in an arbitrator. Those rules more or less have been borrowed from judicial code of ethics. These are uh, informal code of ethics. Uh, there is a uh, judicial restatement of values and principles. There are two which are available on the net which guide judges on what kind of cases they should recuse from. It is unfortunate that uh, we are not required to spell out the reasons for recusal. That should be a healthy practice. A judge should normally disclose why the judge is recusing from hearing a case. So that, I think, answers your question. The comment on agent of the British, I know this is uh, WhatsApp University's favorite pastime. <laughs> if after reading Mahatma Gandhi's life, what's written about him, if after reading this book on Mahatma Gandhi by DeSalvo, if you still want to believe the WhatsApp University, all the best to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been wonderful being here at Mantan.